In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. Introducing St. Jude Flashpoint. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we let it affect us. Rate, review, and subscribe to St. Jude Flashpoint. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to The Sidebar, a weekly show on the community, arts, culture, and more. Today, I'm joined by J.D. Rieger, musician, record producer, and podcast host. J.D., thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I found, I I Googled you as part of the preparation for the show, which is really one of the dark secrets of being a podcast host or a radio host. Um, It's no secret to me. (laughs) It's no secret to you. That's right. And we'll talk about that. Um, I found this description. I I assume you put it there on Bandcamp. Memphis born and raised punk rock, power pop, multi-instrumentalist songwriter person. That is as many words as I could jam into (laughs) one sentence, I think. Yeah. Doesn't contemplate... The record producer so much or the podcast host, but you're, but that, that's accurate. You wrote that. Yes, I did. Yeah. I'm, I've never re- felt great about any of the bio stuff that yeah. I write about myself. Yeah. So that makes me cringe a little bit hearing that spoken yeah. out loud. Oh, absolutely. But yeah. yeah, yeah, I did write that. You, wh- why, for you, why, why music? I mean, um, you've been a musician I for don't many know. years. I don't know if I had a choice, honestly. My father was a uh, working musician. And I just grew up around it constantly, around bands, band practices. We always had bands staying at our house, practicing at our house, recording at the house sometimes. I don't, I don't know if there was really a way for me to do anything yeah. else. Yeah. It, 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 when did you start playing? My first gig in front of drinking adults was when I was 14. <laughs> I played at the Antenna in my dad's band, Spitshine. Uh, before that, I think I had played a couple of gigs at like church functions or something. Oh, the, that's a great contrast. You've got the antenna club and church. Yeah. I didn't, I, I will say I didn't really go to church, but I played in <laughs> bands with, I went to a Christian high school and played in bands with, yeah. with church going people. So my first gig in front of anyone was at some sort of youth group thing. Yeah. Uh, you've, I'm going to come back to music in a little bit, but just re- you're in the midst of releasing, I don't know how to do the timing on this. You've released a couple new songs. Yeah. Uh, I, I Towards an album that is coming out, what, later this year or even, when we'll, tell me tell me when that album comes out too. Absolutely. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I put out a new single called Back Off and that's actually not on the record. The reason I put it out was because it had sort of been cut from the record, but I love that song and the B-side to it so much that I thought that they should... They should come out, and since my record is stuck in the queue at a pressing plant in Czechoslovakia, or I guess that's the Czech, the Czech Republic, the Czech Republic, yeah. more properly, right. um, and it may not be till the end of the year till I actually have those records in my hand. I thought I'd go ahead and just put something out. Yeah, um, you're. I, so that's a COVID thing. The, the, the supply chain oh, issues I mean, of the a, album, or is that just the nature of albums right there now? There are definitely, yeah, it's the nature of the entire vinyl industry right now. There's only a couple of places making the actual, yeah. you know, source materials that you need to make records. And there's only so many pressing plants and only so many people who can do the mastering. Um, so, yes, and because of the tremendous resurgence of vinyl, everybody and their brother is now trying to put out records. Yeah. Uh, wh- why do you think um, diff- lots of different people answer this differently, but for you, why is there this resurgence in mm. vinyl? I mean, for me, records never left. I've always had a turntable. I've moved turntables, you know, from city to city with me and records to great, you know, personal expense and, you know, investment of time. Uh, so, I mean, it's just a, it's a beautiful format. You get, you get to, you get much better cover art. Um, I, I personally think it sounds better. I know some people say, you know, you don't get the pops and the cracks, but if you take care of your records, you don't get those anyway. Yeah. So I, I've just, I always preferred records. I'm happy to see them back. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the things I miss most about records, about albums is you mentioned the artwork and the liner notes and that sort of the whole experience of getting an album, 
seeing where, you know, if it was, if it opened you or you pulled the sleeve out and you would sort of say, oh my gosh, that was recorded at wherever. And I didn't know that person played on this song. And you got just even the, even to have the, the, the lineup, let alone a big write up of the production. I mean, just the simple facts. And it's so interesting now that for all this money and progress, I don't know, progress is the right word. I should say that with quotes, with streaming services and all all that's kind of lost if you get it's just there's not a digital remotely a digital sort of um, version of that wonderful mystery and excitement of getting an actual album unless I, there's something out there I'm missing with streaming and digital music no there's not and to me it's the same as like the whole like Kindle and e-reader deal versus actually having a book if right. you send me you know a book to read, in PDF form, I'm not going to read it. Like, yeah. I need an actual book. Right. I'm still old school like that. And a record is a piece of art. That's why, you know, CDs are disposable. People just throw those things away when they get tired of them. But you almost never see records on the curb, even yeah. if they're terrible records, <laughs> because they are they are works of art. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, You're also doing a podcast, I mentioned at the top. Um, yeah. You started in the early pandemic Time yes. frame or was it already on deck as something you wanted to do? Well, it was it's something that's been in the back of my mind, something, you know, back burner idea for years and years now. In fact, I even started a podcast several years ago and got through like three or four episodes and then had a technical crisis and then let, you know, I just quit. Uh, but I've been a music writer for 20 years or something, and my favorite part of the process was always doing the interviews, the conversations. Really? Always, always, always. So I just decided maybe I'll just do my favorite part and just do that. Yeah, yeah. So it's Back back to the Light is back. the name of the podcast series. Absolutely. People, people back to the light dot net. <laughs> dot net. Yeah, no, got to do that. Um, and we are speaking to uh, J.D. Rieger uh, this week on The Sidebar. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian. Um We'll come back and talk more with J.D. here in a second. But the sidebar airs every Thursday at 1130 on WYXR 91.7. It's focused on the community, arts, culture, and everything in between. It's not just a podcast, though, or not just a radio I sh show, I should say. It's also one of many weekly podcasts we do at The Daily Memphian, including the Behind the Headlines podcast, as well as Bill Drees' politics podcast, a number of sports podcasts, and Jennifer Biggs' food podcast, Soundbites, which also airs on WYXR every Thursday at 11. All of our podcasts are on the Daily Memphian site, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. People can get your podcast, J.D., where? Oh, everywhere. everywhere. Same places, Spotify, yeah. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or yeah. backtothelight.net. Backtothelight.net. Um, you are, you're also, there's a record label. You, you were, we were joking. We had some technical issues that you were, uh, that I caused that you were very uh, patient with here and helped me out with. Uh, but you said you'd be, you're actually working on someone else's album later today. Is that? I am. I am working on a new record by a band called the sub teens that used to be pretty big in Memphis. And, uh, I love them. They're one of my all time favorite Memphis bands. And yeah, they've got, we've got nine, the beginnings of nine songs started hope, hoping to get 11 or 12 we're recording where? We're recording in my friend's uh, private studio in Midtown. Yeah. 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 So, stu the state of <clears throat> the state of studios, you know, I mean, in Memphis specifically is what? There's, I mean, there are great studios in Memphis, great historical studios. Ardent is certainly one. Royal is another one. And at High Low is not a historical studio, but they do great work over there. There are great studios in Memphis, but with technology being what it is, there are so many home studios and home recordists that it's really possible. I mean, I did most my record almost entirely myself in my basement in Chicago. You don't have to have a studio anymore unless you want one. It's kind of a luxury. You know, you're paying for the engineer or the producer and the extra input as much as you're paying for the space and the technology at this point, I feel. And so, I mean, would you do you foresee yourself ever... I mean, in that sort of classic way, going back into a studio and doing an album start to finish. Oh, I'd love to, you know, pandemic willing and given the budget. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, I record myself as much out of necessity as, you know, that being an aesthetic choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the um, some of the people back to I'm bouncing around, but some of the other people you're working with, 
the, in terms of, let's start with, with music. And I think there's some crossover. I mean, I think some of these people you've interviewed on the podcast and you're working with them musically, but some of the other people, um, bands that you're working with right now. Well, currently the label I've put out two way radio, which was a band I was in, you know, 10 years ago. And I've put out a Chicago band called Arthur this past weekend. We just celebrated the release of the loose opinions record. And we're also, I'm putting out my own music, of course. We've got a new record also in the queue by Jeremy Scott from The Raining Sound. And my record's in the queue and other stuff in the works. Oh, Blind Copy, which is more of an industrial project. Uh, that's going to be coming out in September, actually, a single. Mm -hmm. So, yes, lots of things in the works. I'm recording a new Subteens record that will hopefully be out next year. Yeah. So, yes, working with lots of people. When you say the Subteens, is that the album you're working on now that you're hoping yes, for next year? Yes, that's what I'm doing today. Yeah. How long does it take to put an album? I mean, that's a dumb question, but well, I'm really curious. This answer is probably a little bit weird because we're going to be doing, there's travel involved in us all working together. And uh, I'm not sure what the pandemic's going to let us yeah, do well, that, necessarily. Yeah. But uh, we've been working for three days here. We're hoping to get up most of our basic tracks done. Our goal is to, you know, hopefully have recording done by the end of the year so that we can send it off to the pressing plant. Yeah. Um, the, the podcast, some of the other folks you've had on there include, Oh, uh, some of my favorite musicians of all time, uh, Howard Grimes, Al Green's drummer, Matthew cause from not a surf, whose, uh, handwriting is tattooed on my arm and, oh my goodness, Craig Wedren from shutter to think one of my all time favorite bands. But I mean, the, some of the Memphis guests, Steve Selvage is a great interview, uh, Janet Simpson from Alabama. She's she's got a fantastic new record out. Uh, Elizabeth King, the gospel singer, was on the show. I I could I mean I could literally yeah. name every episode if you let me. What have you What have you enjoyed? I mean, is it what you learn from them? Is it a sense that you're giving exposure to these musicians whose work and oh you like and love? I mean, is it a little of all that? I mean, I'm I'm certainly I'm getting the rub from Matthew Cause. Let's make no mistake about it. There, you know, I'm. I'm getting more exposed by their audience than the other way around for sure. But it, it's, it's, it's having a conversation like this, sharing ideas, um, sharing an experience, having a sense that one of my all time favorite moments, honestly, when I think about recording a, the podcast was when I was talking to Matthew cause, who's one of my all time favorite songwriters again from the band, not a surf. And he was playing it. He plays a song live on the podcast. And while we were recording it, that moment, he was playing a song only to me, only in my headphones. And I swear, I had goosebumps all over my body. It was a magical moment. Yeah. It, you, you're doing a couple a week, right? I, I mean... It, well, I it, do it, one Back to the Light podcast every week. And okay. then I also host the Shangri-La Records podcast, which comes out once a month. And we're actually going to be putting out a new episode at the end of this week with Zach Corsa from Non Kana, the ambient like experimental band. Yeah. You, are you, but you're enjoying it. I love it. I absolutely love it. I love talking to people, especially now. I, I mean, if I was just isolated in Chicago, not doing a podcast, I don't yeah. know what I would do with myself. Cause I'd probably never talk to anybody. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've mentioned Chicago a couple of times. You are from Memphis. Tell me your Memphis to Chicago born, story. Born and yeah. raised in Memphis. Um, lived here almost my entire life, except for a couple of years stint in Murfreesboro. Um, I moved to Chicago because my wife got hired at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is the art museum from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> and just one of the world's great art museums. Uh, it is frankly. indeed. It's a it's an amazing place to get to go and hang out for free sometimes. When I'm lacking inspiration, there's plenty to be found. Yeah. Yeah. I, I once went there, um, just was in Chicago. We thought, well, let's go by the Art Institute. And it was, I think it was a weekday. It wasn't really packed. And they had this, the, the mo I think really the most amazing traveling exhibit I'd ever been to of Van Gogh's and Picasso's. And it was some insane thing that only, you know, a couple of museums in the world, the art institute could, could have the, the weight to get this collection. And you just kept turning corners and go, oh, there's, there, there are five or six Van Gogh's just in this room. And then the next room, there'd be more. And then there'd be Picasso's. And just, Absolutely. it was, it, it was amazing. Not just because they were, you know, big name artists, but to pull them all into one place that way. I, I, I love the Art Institute. It, it's amazing. Um, this is uh, the sidebar 
I'm Eric Barnes from the Daily Memphian. Uh, Sidebar airs every Thursday at 1130 on WYXR 91.7. If you missed any of the Sidebar, um, you can get the full show at the WYXR.org website or download their app. You can get it there as well. Or you can get it on the Daily News site, or excuse me, the Daily Memphian site, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, a quick message from one of our sponsors. Introducing St. Jude Flashpoint. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we let it affect us. Rate, review, and subscribe to St. Jude Flashpoint. I should say also that uh, coming up soon um, in the next couple of weeks on the sidebar, Zach Ives from Goner Records will be on. Uh, Goner Fest is right around the corner. I think I think they did announce that they're requiring vaccines, and so hopefully everything goes off well with that. But I look forward to getting Zach, who also hosts the show here on uh, WYXR every week. Uh, Andy Nix, who uh, is from My City Rides, the scooters you see riding around town, is a very interesting story, and he'll be on in the next couple of weeks. Recently, if you missed past episodes of the show, uh, we had the folks from um, Mark Fleischer from Storyboard, and um, he is working with um, on this Memphis-centric product uh, project, which is going to do a bunch of interesting videos, Memphis-centric, Mem- Memphis-centric. Uh, videos on an over-the-top you'll get on Roku, Apple, the uh, Fire, uh, Amazon Fire, etc. cetera. Um, Creative Works uh, as well. And also, if you are a fan or if you've watched or if you've never watched uh, Behind the Headlines on WKNO, you can get past episodes of that show on um, YouTube, on WY, uh, excuse me, WKNO.org, et cetera, et cetera. We did a really, really good show recently, not for anything I did, on the end of the eviction moratorium. Uh, what is likely about to happen and all of the growing issues with affordable housing in Memphis. It was very, very um, difficult and and kind of profound. Again, not for anything I said, but it was it's one you should watch. We also this week have a show coming up on homelessness and efforts that Memphis is making to address homelessness and also just the state of homelessness in some of the cities around the country. It's pretty uh, profoundly bad. So be looking for that one. Um, but I am here today with uh, J.D. Rieger talking about your podcast, talking about the the, the record label. Um, COVID, you, we've mentioned this. I mean, you've alluded to it. It's just been a disaster for everyone. I don't think it's been good for anyone. For musicians particularly and so many performing arts, you know, I, I've talked to folks from the Orpheum and other, you know, arts groups around town, the um, – um, the opera. I mean, everyone has tried to find a way to get through this. And, you know, the opera really did Memphis, um, opera Memphis did some really creative things. And I mean, everybody's done what they can, but it's just been kind of disastrous. It is not normal. Um, you can't, if you're a programmer, you can kind of go home and work on your laptop. If you're a musician, you can't replicate the experience of being in a band, in a club, in a venue, playing music live. There's just not a way to replicate that. No. There's not. And uh, certainly COVID or the resurgence of it affected our plans in a negative way this past weekend, forcing us to do. I had to cancel a show that I had and then we had to move another one outside, you know, which in August is less than ideal. So I would not say that I'm unaffected, but I always hesitate to say this. In a way, the pandemic did sort of save Saved my life. Yeah. How? Well, I was I was pretty miserable in the job I was working in Chicago and not doing any of this. Yeah. And so when I lost my job because of the pandemic, I was more or less forced to confront the fact that I wanted to be doing something else with my life anyway, and I better get started on that now while I still have time. Yeah. It is one of those interesting things, big and small. I mean, I've asked most everybody I've interviewed during and, well, I say since, you know, is in the, you know, since we've been doing the sidebar, since YXR launched, you know, what were those things that, that you may have, you as an organization or as a person learned in the in the pandemic that you'll carry forward? MIFA, uh, Sally Hines uh, Jones from MIFA, um, had a great example. They, because they, MIFA does a lot of work going to people's houses, you know, particularly homebound seniors, bringing food, meals for wheels. They realized they couldn't go to everybody they wanted to go to, but they would call them. And that was incredibly welcome. And it was kind of this beautiful realization that just to get on the phone with a homebound senior for 20 minutes, half an hour. And it's something that I think they're trying to continue indefinitely because it's just a way to connect with seniors. And people have had amazing little bits like that. For you, I, I, I wonder not to sort of simplify it. I mean, People talk so much about all the hiring trouble. Restaurants are always on the front lines of that conversation. But lots of places are just trouble to hire. I think your story 
is probably a lot of people's story who had a moment, a pause in their life and said, I'm doing this thing that I don't want to do. And it's not about, unemploy- you know, the, there's the politicalization of unemployment benefits, of all these things. But it, it, I think people, Which I am not on, by the way. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Full disclosure. Um, but I think it's, it's really important to say, like, I think a lot of people, and it is underreported, had profound sort of staring themselves in the mirror or the Zoom camera or the whatever sort of moments and say, my life's not doing what I want it to do. And this is a chance for me to change it. Well, more than that, it's just reassessing your own sense of worth. Like, how do I want to be spending my time? Is it really worth it to have a few extra dollars to work a job that I maybe don't like or that's not fulfilling? I'd rather honestly be broke and eat ramen noodles and make podcasts. I mean, I don't mean to sound weird about it or make it sound like, uh, you know, I guess classist or something in any way, but like, I honestly just don't, I have no desire to, to build somebody else's fortune. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not worth my time. And how old are you? I'm 42. 42. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and you know, I mean, I think I'm 53, so I'm 10 plus years older than you. And it's just various points, you know, you just look at certain things you're doing and I don't need to do that anymore. I mean, I have, there's a strange sort of, you know, this momentum to things that happen in your life, this sort of sense of, you know, um, uncontrolled momentum and some things, I'm not that my life is perfect, but I think I saw an old friend recently who I hadn't seen in six, seven years. And I said, you know, in, in most ways, I'm the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. You know, why did it take getting to be 53 (laughs) to figure that out? But it was partly cutting off certain things that were not good. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a certain amount of you know, mental health aspect to that as well. Uh, You know, it wasn't just that I lost my job and had nothing else to do. So I did all this. It was also that I had, you know, recently gone through a pretty major depressive episode and then had gone into therapy. Mm -hmm. And I've also, I'm two years alcohol free. That's good for you. And doing, you know, doing a lot better with myself mentally. So when I was pushed off that ledge by the pandemic, I was in a place where I was ready to hit the ground running instead of, you know, maybe drinking myself to death or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you hear those stories. I yeah. mean, of people who kind yeah. of were, you know, I mean, it's a terrible, terrible rise in the drug abuse and, you know, all kinds of terrible things. But it's great to hear. I mean, I don't mean this in a sort of patronizing way because I feel like it's going to sound that way. But it's great to hear a story of somebody who changed their life. They yeah. used this terrible experience to make profound change. Sometimes I feel guilty about it, honestly, because so many other people have such horrible experiences in the past year and a half or so or however long it's been. And I hate to say it, but I mean, I I hate that so many people have gotten sick and certainly, you know, died and all that stuff. But I mean, this has been one of the best years of my life. Yeah. No, I think I I think personally that you shouldn't apologize at all for that. I mean, I think because you're saying it with respect and humility, not, you know. Yeah, I wish respect for other people's situations, you know, because every everyone's situation. Yeah, I certainly wish it had come under better circumstances, (laughs) you know, (laughs) absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, With a few minutes left here again, we're here with J.D. Rieger. He's got um, a couple songs. Where where can people get the songs, the the songs that you released with the album down the road? Everything that I do, the podcast, the record label, my own music, the other bands I put out, everything can be found at backtothelight.net. You can also find me on Bandcamp. Uh, it's just JD Rieger, yeah. R E A, big R, little eager, as we, <laughs> as I like to say. And um, I'm on Bandcamp. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on everything you can be on. Yeah, yeah. How how is that? I mean, you've been a musician since you were. What'd you say? Fourteen was your first live gig. First first gig to drinking adults. Yes. <laughs> first gig to drinking adults. There's a big story there that I'm not sure we'll get to. Um, it's because it's an interesting characterization. Um, but you, how streaming and digital and all that, we talked about albums, but bigger picture, you know, for yourself, for bands you, you follow, bands you've interviewed, bands you love and have always loved, how much from a musician's point of view has streaming changed things? And, and is it for the better or the worse? I mean, I think it can be both, certainly. I think it opens up a whole new ticket option for Gonerfest, for instance, for the people who can't make it to Gonerfest, they can chip in their 20 bucks or whatever it is that it costs to watch the festival from home. And that's a whole new revenue stream that yeah. didn't, did not exist until last year. Yeah. So, I mean, there are certainly uh, 
pros and cons. I mean, making a podcast is a, a good medium to be in right now because it's going to be in people's ears no matter what's happening. Yeah. You know, so that's, you know, it's good and bad. It does. Maybe it encourages some people to stay home when they could have gone out or some, I guess that's the logic that would be the argument against streaming. Yeah. I yeah. guess that it makes it, you know, more convenient to watch on the couch and that's a drag for the performer. But I say the more people watching you, however they're watching you is great. I, and I, 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 I would think so. And I'm, I'm a big music fan. I'm not musical, but I'm a big music fan. And I probably have said this on the podcast, like early, for me, I, I haven't watched much music streaming or otherwise, just because it kind of sort of depressed me because it made me, it reinforced one. It's just not the same, even the best. I mean, it's I, even the best concert video is still concert footage, the produced, whatever the hell. It's just not the same as being there for somebody who really likes live performances. Yeah, for, for sure. Performer, performer included. The performer included. Right. I got to believe. And, um, I mean, when we do, yeah, but I got to believe that. And, but the other thing was it was kind of depressing because it reinforced the sense that I was stuck on my couch, unable to go to a show. And I, that may just be a unique, you know, uh, yeah. sort of reaction I have. You know, I definitely miss playing shows and going to shows, but I do like having the option of sometimes, you know, staying in the home and still being able to support something. Yeah. You know, I've watched a ton of shows streaming from B-Side and Black Lodge and The Lamplighter and all kinds of stuff from my couch yeah. in Chicago and... Before this year, I would have missed Never all that stuff. That. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's cool to be able to watch Memphis shows from my house. Yeah. I think for me, too, it's also that choice, you know, which we're not quite there yet because none of people are getting their vaccines. But um, if they would yeah. and everything That's would come together. Thing. Yeah. I, it, but it's, um, it just kind of is the scientific reality. And but I think if I weren't forced only if I if I didn't have just the mere option of streaming, I'd pro I probably would enjoy it more. Actually, the more I think about it, it's partly that sense of being forced, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's here to stay. Yeah. And, and I'm glad about that. I think I sounded like I was an old man about it. A um, couple of questions before we wrap up. Um, I've asked virtually everyone since we started doing the podcast, your first, this is a weird one though for you, your first concert, the first concert you ever watched, attended. The first one I ever remember was 1986. The Monkees, Herman's Hermits, Grassroots, and Gary Puckett and the Union Gap at Mud Island. Wow. I remember that concert pretty vividly. I was seven years old. Yeah. Great show. I'm told I was at other stuff before that. Right. But People generally have that. I think Robbie Grant, you know, had the, the executive director of- I'm of told I was watched. at like a Bob Marley show when I was a baby, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, have, that I have no memory of that. <laughs> yeah. I walked by the Beach Boys at a- the Puyallup, the Western Washington State Fair, but I, I was, and I think maybe we sort of stopped and watched a song or something. I don't really count that one. And what did, uh, Robbie Grant had a really funny, just like an amazing one. He goes, but honestly, I was 11 and I was distracted and I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. You know, it was some show or something. I was only seven at this monkey show, but at the time I was obsessed with the monkeys because this was right when their TV show had just come back out on like VH1 and yeah. MTV and all that stuff. And I mean, that's honestly... As much the reason I play music now as the whole stuff about my dad also. Yeah, that's wild, actually. I, I wanted, I wanted to be Mickey Dolan's when I was a kid so bad. That's a, it's a kind of, a kind of um, sneaky, witty show. They got away with a bunch of, just on the pure, the humor of it and the kind of style and stuff. They were actually kind of, I remember, it, it's, it's the monkeys. People need to watch the monkeys. All right, JD, thanks again. Back to the light, uh, dot net. Gets, gets net. people everything and everywhere they need to be in terms of all the things you're working on. Thank you for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thanks for helping me out with some technical issues. That was uh, above and beyond. But um, again, join us again next week. We air every Thursday at 1130 on WYXR 91.7. It's the sidebar. Uh, if you missed any of the show today, you can get the full podcast of the interview on the Daily Memphian site, WYXR, wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast as well as to the Daily Memphian. Um, we need your support. We want your support. And we appreciate it. Thanks. And we'll see you again next week. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.